All right, we'll wait one minute and see if more people come and then we'll get started. Okay, um, this is part 21 in our continuing series on the fourth chapter of Bav Mitzia. Uh, and we are going to be on pages 54B and 55A this evening. We are about two thirds of the way through the chapter. I hope we are on schedule to finish the chapter this school year, I guess we'll see. Um, in any case, we've been discussing various different issues about the extra fifth that you sometimes have to pay when you uh, desacralize something or when you pay back for something that you took without permission. And um, we have another, a new issue this evening, which is to, uh, that this is gonna be a little bit complicated and I will do my best, uh, but if it's not clear, I guess maybe we can try to, Try again next week, but we'll. I'll do my best. The issue this evening is whether the fifth is itself subject to the requirement of a fifth. Okay, and for some of the fifths, it's going to be clear that they are, and for others, we're going to try to figure it out, and maybe we'll figure it out, maybe. Um, but we're going to start with one where it is clear. So let me read it, and then I'll I'll do my best to explain. Amarava, Gabe Gazel, Ktiv, I think that should be Gazel, sorry. Um, so when it, the Torah is talking about theft, and this is Gezel, not Gineva, the kind of theft that you do not sneakily. So this is, uh, I don't know, pickpocketing or mugging or something like that, not sneaking into someone's house when they're not there. With reference to that kind of theft, if you are made to take an oath about the theft and you swear falsely, and you then admit that you swore falsely, then you have to refund the money that you stole and pay an extra fifth. And there the Pasuk says, the Chamishitav Yosef Alav. Right? And he will add his fifths to it. And it, the, the word fifth seems to be plural. This yud here between the tough and the vav would ordinarily make it plural. It's not clear what that would mean. And so that's what we're interested in here. Utnan and the mission says, Natan lo et akaren v'nishba lo al hachomesh. So suppose that you in fact stole the money, and then you swore falsely about it, and then you admitted that you swore falsely, and so now you owe one hundred and twenty-five percent of the original amount of money, and you pay the principal of the money, and deny that you owe the fifth. And they say, do you swear that you don't owe it? And you swear. And then you admit that you swore falsely. So now have you stolen this fifth such that you now have to pay 125% of it? And the answer is yes. You continue. Yeah. Why wouldn't you owe the fifth if you stole the money? So... The question is really, I think, whether swearing falsely about money that you only owed to begin with as a fine, whether that's the same thing as swearing falsely about money that you stole. Because you didn't actually do a physical act of stealing with this money. 
You just refused to pay it when you were fined. So he refused. Okay, so he stole, say, a hundred. Yeah. So you, you, the, the, uh, this person, we'll call him Fred. Fred stole a hundred dollars, and then the victim brought him to court. Fred swore in court that he did not steal a hundred dollars. Then the next day, Fred feels guilty. He comes back. He confesses. So the court says, okay, now you need to pay back $125. Fred hands the victim a $100 bill and says, I don't owe you $25. The court says, that's ridiculous. Will you swear that you don't owe the $25? And Fred says, yes, I swear that I don't owe $25. I still don't get it. Why wouldn't he owe the fifth? One second. So then he comes back the next day and he says, I lied when I said I when I swore that I didn't know 25. And so now we're saying that he owes he owes not just the 25 he lied about, but also an extra 25 percent of that, which now the numbers are going to get messy. But the, the, let's call that six dollars. So now we're going to make him pay thirty one dollars. And now he coughs up the twenty five dollars and lies about the six dollars. Uh-huh. And swears that he doesn't know the six dollars. And they uh then he comes back the next day and says, I'm sorry, I lied about the six dollars. And they say, Well, okay, now you owe seven and a half dollars. He pays the six dollars and lies about the dollar fifty. And swears that he doesn't owe a dollar fifty. Then he comes back the next day and apologizes for lying about the dollar fifty. And they say, Well, now you owe uh a dollar ninety. Yeah, that these numbers are not exactly right anymore because I'm approximating, but close right, enough. Right, right, right. And he pays the dollar fifty and lies about the forty cents. And at this point, we say forty cents is worth less than a pruto. We're not going to convene a court case over forty cents. Go away. So, and why is he swearing on something that everyone that Halak okay determined? So, this- this guy's behavior is obviously not responsible and it may not be rational. Um, but I think it the Mishnah is trying to give us right a a theory about how the Chomesh works, that if you don't pay the Chomesh, that's stealing. And the way that we're expressing that is by saying that you, you know. You you owe a fifth on it if you swear about it. Now, it doesn't seem very likely that he's going to do it, but it's not. In general, the Mishnah doesn't require its cases to be likely. They just have to be physically possible. And this is certainly physically possible. It's not impossible. It's just stupid. Right. I just, oh. I guess, I, I, I just don't understand why he's even being asked to swear on something that everyone knows he has to he has to pay. So I guess there's two possibilities. One is that they think that they can force him to pay it by telling him he has to swear, because most uh, people would rather pay than swear. Uh, Although once okay. you've discovered that this guy doesn't feel that way, I would think you'd stop. Right. Um, the other possibility is that he doesn't actually have the money and they're trying to, you know, create a court record that will, you know, allow them to collect later. Okay. But I I don't, I I don't really know for sure. Okay. Well, those make sense. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. Okay. So that's the, the fifth, the extra fifth, the homage that you pay for Gizela for stealing and then swearing falsely, that fifth, can propagate. It produces another fifth, which produces another fifth, and so on, if you don't pay it. Okay. Our next case is about truma. Gabe truma aktiv. With reference to truma, the Torah says, Ich ki yochal kodesh bishgaga v'yasav chamishito alav. If a man eats uh, something holy by mistake, then he will add a fifth to it. Utsnan. And the Mishnah says, Somebody who eats truma by mistake pays principal and a fifth. So if I, by mistake, ate, um, say, a pound of truma grapes, 
Now I take a pound and a quarter of grapes and I give them to a Kohen as truma. Okay, it's important that it actually be fruit because of what's going to happen next. Um, and it doesn't matter what I did with it. If you ate it or you drank it or you used it as, as moisturizer, any of those counts as eating for our purposes here. So if I drank truma wine or I anointed myself with truma olive oil or I ate my, as I said, truma grapes, it doesn't make any difference whether the truma was tahor or tame, even though even a Kohen can't eat truma that's tame. But whatever, it's eaten already, it's too late. Either way, he pays a fifth and a fifth of a fifth. So in the example that I gave, I ate a pound of truma grapes. And now when I realize that that's what I did, I take a pound and a quarter of truma grapes and I give them to, or that that's uh, 20 ounces of truma grapes. And I give them to my brother-in-law, the Kohen, as truma. Except now by mistake, while I'm at his house, the extra four ounces of grapes that I gave as the that I gave as the chomesh, I eat them by mistake. So now I realize my mistake and I give him five ounces of grapes back as 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 a repayment for the four ounces that I ate. And then the next day I come and again I make a mistake and I eat the one ounce of uh, that that was the extra ounce I gave yesterday of grapes. And again, it was a mistake. So I give one and a quarter ounces the next day as, as payment. And this one doesn't actually seem to have a, this one does not say that it terminates when the amount becomes so small as to be ridiculous. I don't know whether it has a termination point or not, but it doesn't say that it does. Deborah, okay. yeah. How do, you, how do you know from the text that he actually ate the fifth? Where does it say because, he ate the fifth? Because it says that he pays a fifth of a fifth. Right. And the only reason that he would pay anything for the fifth is if he ate it. So we're assuming that's what it means. Yes. But and I, I think mostly what it's telling us is that the food that you gave to replace the truma, even the extra food that you gave to replace that isn't really replacing truma, it's just a fine, right. becomes real truma. It, it, it it, uh, it has all of the legal status of truma so that it generates fines if you eat it by mistake and so on. Okay. Okay. Um, although, as I said, there may be a termination point at which you have eaten so little that no one cares. But if so, the mission does not tell us that. Um, it could be. Harvey suggests that maybe the termination point is one grape. Maybe. I don't know. Sometimes we're a little nutty about truma and kudshim, so maybe, maybe not. I don't like to predict these things because I, I don't actually know the answer. Okay. However, okay, so we had, I think we originally had five different areas of law in which there was a chomesh. And we saw certainly at least two others that we haven't addressed here. Right? We, we, we have said that there is a fifth of a fifth in truma. There is a fifth of a fifth in theft. We have not addressed the question of the extra fifth that you pay when you desacralize your own Maser Shani. And we have not addressed the question of the extra fifth that you pay when you desacralize your own um, donated sanctified property. And that is what we're going to spend the rest of the evening. Um, now, in those two cases, it's a little bit unclear what the Maser Shani case would be. Because the only way you could be, the only possibility of desacralizing the fifth that you gave as money would be if you then turn it into food, which, right, so you took it to your shalayim, you bought food with it, now you're supposed to eat that food as Maser Shani. And now there is a machloket, whether it's possible sometimes, as we saw this machloket a couple of weeks ago, whether it's possible to desacralize that food again. And I think that's what the, what our discussion has to be about, is whether the food bought with the extra fifth of the money from the Maser Shani, whether when you desacralize it, you have to pay an extra fifth, according to the people who think that's a possibility. But the, the Gemara never lays out exactly what it's talking about. Okay. Um, 
In any case, let's read this. So, v'ilu gabe maaser. So, with reference to maaser, lo michtav ketiv. It doesn't say that it was written in the Torah. V'lo mitnatana, and it doesn't say that it was written taught in a brayta. V'lo ibai ibaylan, and it doesn't seem like we have asked a question among us amoraim, right? In all of the three layers of history that the Gemara is able to see, uh, it doesn't look like anyone's ever up to the point where this Gemara conversation is happening, dealt with the question of whether in Maser Shani there is such a thing as a fifth of a fifth. And Gabe Hektesh, um, uh, sorry, so and that, so now we're going to, we're going to try to figure it out based on this uh, quote from Hektesh. So Gabe Hektesh Ketiv, with reference to the Hektesh, this, the, this is the sanctified property that you donated in order to pay for it so that the temple can end up with money um we're not talking about sacrifices here we're talking about just property that was donated in order for the value to be used for the upkeep of the building so um it's the pasuk says v'im hamakdish yig al ed beto v'yasav chamishit chamishit kasef erkach so if the sanctifier the person who donated the property wants to desacralize his own house then he needs to add a fifth of the money of the value your valuation now this is a little different than before the two psukim we had before one of them said his fifth chamishito and the other one said his fifths plural chamishitav and the gemara seems interested in the fact that this does not say his fifth it just says a fifth okay Utsnan, and the Mishnah says, Hapoded Hekdesho Mosif Chomesh. The Mishnah teaches that somebody who desacralizes their own sanctified property has to add a fifth. Chumshutsnan, the Mishnah teaches us a fifth. Chumshut de Chumshalotsnan, but the Mishnah does not tell us that you have to uh, do a fifth of a fifth. Now, it seems like what that would mean is suppose that you, instead of redeeming or desacralizing your property with money, suppose you gave property. Okay, so you you had donated, I don't know, a dining room table. It was worth $1,000. And you want to desacralize it, so you're going to have to pay $1,250 because you have to pay the, an extra fifth. And so you trade in a couch that's worth $1,000 and a chair that's worth $250 for the table, okay? Now, the table goes back to being ordinary secular property. It's yours. You can take it home. But now you want your couch and your chair back. So the question seems to be, granted that the couch just kind of took the place of the table. A ta table is worth $1,000. The couch is worth $1,000. You traded one for the other. So the couch, presumably, you're going to have to add a fifth to its value in order to desacralize it. But the chair wasn't really instead of anything. It was just the extra money they made you pay. So do you have to pay an extra fifth when you desacralize the chair also? Okay. And keep in mind, by the way, that anyone else who buys this stuff from the temple treasury at the auction does not have to pay the extra fifth. So it's not the case that everybody who desacralizes this stuff has to pay the extra fifth. It's only the original owner. So it, it seems like there's some kind of technicality happening here. And we're not sure whether that technicality only happens with the original donation or with the original donation and things that replace it or with the original donation, the things that replace it and the extra fifth. Yes, John. So uh, if it was the br brother of the person or the spouse of the person does it still mean that they don't have to do the extra fifth or is so there I don't some actually, relationship i'm not sure that i've seen a text about the hectish case in that regard mm -hmm. um with master shaney the answer is that those are separate people unless the brothers are 
living off of the undistributed estate of their father who has died, but the property hasn't been divided, in which case they might legally be one person. But except for that one very specific case where they, their money is so tangled up, it's impossible to separate it. Um, brothers are definitely separate people. And even spouses are mostly separate people, according to most people. Um, okay, so... And it probably works the same way here, but I, 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 I haven't specifically seen it addressed about this. Okay, so the, um, the Gemara tries to compare it to Truma and see if that will, if we can make something out of that. My gabe Truma So by Truma, the verse says he's he needs to add or he will add gabe hektish nami and also. By the sanctified property, it says he will add. So maybe they're the same, in which case he would add need to pay a fifth of a fifth. Oh, Dilma, or maybe Gabe Truma Ktiv with the Truma, it does say, and he will add. So maybe what really happened with the Truma is that, remember that the reason why we said there was a fifth of a fifth for the theft case is because the pasuk about the theft had the word fifth in plural. It was v'chamishitav and his fifths. So maybe what really happened with truma is that we said, well, we've got this extra vav on v'yasaf and he will add. Let's take it off of v'yasaf and put it on the end of his fifth, of Hamishito. Then we'll pretend it's really a vav. Uh, yud, sorry, not a vav. Smush it all together and pretend that it says Hamishitav. We're going to move this little line over here from Biasaf and stick it over here on Hamishito to turn it into Hamishitav. Which is a very strange kind of Midrash. I think this is the only place I've ever seen this style of Midrash in which we're actually literally suggesting that we turn a letter on one word into a different letter that's of the same shape, but a different letter on a different word. Um, that seems extraordinary, but that seems to be what we're doing. And it would become, it would become his fifths. So maybe that's how we learn to begin with that Truma has a fifth and fifth. But, but the, uh, the pasuk about the sanctified property says, the Asaf Hamishit, it just says, and he will add a fifth. Even if we take off the Vav of the word and he will add, and we add it to the word Hamishit, so in the end, you still only have his fifth. You don't have enough little lines to make it plural. So maybe we can't make the case with the uh, sanctified property. Maybe we can't say that we're going to have a fifth of a fifth because we don't have an extra little line lying around that we can use to make the word fifth plural. Um, okay, so we're going to try something else. So let's try instead, let's try a logical derivation instead of a, uh, a textual one. And let's say that this extra stuff that got donated to the temple as the extra fifth payment when I was desacralizing my property, let's say that it is going to have the same status as what we're going to call Hecte Shani, secondary consecration, which is when I um, make something holy because something else is holy. So for our purposes at the moment, let's say that the secondary consecration is the couch that I traded for the table. Right? Originally, the table was holy. I traded in the couch. So now the holiness moved from the table onto the couch. The couch is not holy because I said it's holy. It's holy because it you know, absorbed its holiness from the table. So let's say that the chair that I paid as my fine for de desacralizing my own property Let's say that the chair also absorbs holiness from the table in the same way, and I'm going to have to pay an extra fifth for it also because it is secondary property. Now, 
we're going to have to prove that secondary consecration has a fifth, which is where we're going now. The Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, and Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, A hektesh rishon mosif chomesh, al hektesh sheni ain mosif chomesh. So Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, there is only a fine of a fifth when redeeming your property if it was the stuff you originally consecrated. So, in fact, it sounds like my table, which I consecrated to begin with, I would have to pay an extra fifth. But the stuff that I trade in for the table, all of it, even the, the stuff that represents the original value, the principal value, is I'm not going to have to pay a fifth for it. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says this fifth thing only happens once on the thing that was originally consecrated. Okay. Amarly Rav Papi lo Ravina. Rav Papi said to Ravina, Hachi Amar Rav. Rav said the following. Chomesh ketchilat hektesh dam. Rav says the fifth is like the first consecration. So it sounds like what we have here is Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi and every Rav are agreeing that the thing I trade in for the couch, for the table, I'm not going to have to pay an extra fifth for. I paid that fifth by paying it on the table. But the extra stuff I trade in for the to pay for the fifth, that stuff's not being exchanged for anything. That's the first time this thing is being holy. And so Rava says, I do pay a fifth on the extra stuff. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, no, you really only just pay the fifth on the original donation. Okay, my Javiela. So, what kind of discussion do we ha do we have quoted about this? And I am not sure we're going to get to the end of this tonight, which has you know not happened in years. Um, but if it happens, it happens, and we'll we'll deal with it next week. Amar of Tavyomi, Mishmei Dabai. So, Rav Tavyomi says the following in the name of Abai. Amar Kra Asaf Chamishit Kesef Erka. The Torah says, and this is the same pasuk that we quoted before, it's actually, you can see in the citation, more than one pasuk. It appears more than once, but it's it's the same words. Um, and he will add a fifth of the silver of your value, your valuation. Makish erko. It says that it connects physically, like they're right next to each other on the page, um, the fifth to the uh, valuation. Makesef erko mosif chomash. So just like you add a fifth on the uh, valuation, af kesef chumsho nami mosif chomash. You also add a fifth on the chomash. Okay, so now it sounds like we have a three-way dispute. It sounds like Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says the only time that you are going to pay an extra fifth is going to be on the original donation. Anything that derives from that, no extra fifth. Rava says the original donation gets a fifth. <coughs> Excuse me. The payment that's directly for the original donation does not get a fifth, even if you need to desacralize it. But the fifth that you paid for the original donation, that's a new thing, so it does get a fifth payment. And Rav Tivyomi seems to think that the whole thing, maybe. Maybe he's agreeing with Rava that only the fifth gets gets a fifth paid for it, or maybe he thinks the whole thing. Um, I, I think it's more likely he thinks the whole thing gets gets a fifth and that it's all consecrated. So if you're going to redeem it, you're going to need to pay a fifth for any of it, the secondary stuff, the fine for the primary stuff, all of it. Okay, so now we're going to go back and discuss Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi further. Remember Rabbi, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi and Rava. So Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is the one who says that the fifth only happens once at the original consecration and Rava said that the fifth still gets its own fifth okay I'm Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi al hektesh rishon mosif chomesh al hektesh sheni ain mosif chomesh so just like I said Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said you add the fifth to the primary consecration and it looks like I didn't translate the second half of the sentence I apologize for that but there's no there's no fifth for the secondary secondary consecration and Rava says, my Tama de Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Rava says, what is Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi's reason? Why does he think that? Amar Kra, 
ואם המקדיש יגאל את ביתו. התורה says, if the sanctifier will redeem his house, המקדיש ולא המדפיס. So it says, you pay the extra fifth when the original sanctifier, meaning we have been describing this person as the original owner, but the Torah describes them as the person who originally made it holy, which I guess is the same thing. You can only make things holy if they belong to you, but that is how the Torah described it. Um, and Rava says, look, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is very interested in this word that he sanctified it, he made it holy, because we only use the word makdish about that first original sanctification, the original donation. If you make something holy by connecting it to something else that's holy, that's actually a different verb. And that verb is matpis, which means to uh, to attach or to connect or to hang, something like that. So, and so Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, well, it says the sanctifier. So the, the person who sanctified it, is that's only the first one. We don't use that word about uh, making something holy because something else was already holy. Okay. So now we switch seats. Tani Tana Kameda Rabbi Elazar. We're we're in now the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Elazar. Not clear how he relates to any of the other people. He is going to mention Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi in a few minutes, so he's certainly later than him. Um, and a Tana recited a Brita in front of Rabbi Elazar. A Tana in this case is not a person from the time of the Mishnah, but a person who's uh role in the Beit Midrash and possibly even their profession. It's not clear to me whether this is a, a full-time job or a part-time job, but the, the, the Tana's job is to be a human uh, library of memorized texts, uh, sort of like in Fahrenheit 451, although without the quite as much oppression and without book burning, right? So you, in Fahrenheit 451, you have a person who has been assigned to each of these works of literature to memorize it and remember it because the books are all being destroyed. They want to be able to reconstruct them later. So in this case, it's not that so much as that we have a tradition that it's is not supposed to be written down. It hasn't at this point yet been written down. And so you have people whose uh, job it is to keep track of certain parts of the written tradition. And they're in the Beit Midrash and you call them over and you say, well, you know, what, what text do we have about whatever? And then they recite stuff at you. Okay, so this Tana recited the following right. Um, so, and this is from the same, uh, the same chapter as the other stuff we've been quoting. But before we were quoting pass the passage about redeeming, desacralizing your house if you had donated it, and now this is later on when it talks about if you donate a non-kosher animal, right? An animal that's not capable of being a sacrifice. So the temple doesn't have any use for it as an animal. Um, it's really just there to be sold for the uh, upkeep. So if it was a non-kosher animal, then he and he redeemed it with your value. Uh, so just as a non-kosher animal is unique, unique, not that the specific animal is unique, but that the uh, status of a non-kosher animal that has been donated to the temple is unique. It's weird uh, in the sense that it's it has to be temporary. Right? The temple it can't hold on to this animal. It doesn't have any use for it in the long term. Unlike, for example, if you donate your house, theoretically at least, if the temple needed to, it could dismantle your house and use those pieces of rock or those pieces of wood to repair things in the temple, right? And if you donate a cow, the temple can offer it as a sacrifice. The donkey is useless. Yes, John? I could imagine using the donkey to carry things to the temple. Sure. You, so that's, it, that, that doesn't make it, so, so yeah, I think the word is not useless, but something different. So it is temporarily useful. In the long run, eventually it won't be able to work anymore and it will its body will be useless to the temple. Unlike the stones from your house, which theoretically could be incorporated permanently into the temple, 
or the cow, which theoretically could be offered as a sacrifice, burned on the altar, the whole thing, all the way to the very end when there's nothing left, would be could be useful to the temple. The donkey is useful as long as it's alive and able to carry stuff. Eventually, it turns into something that's not useful anymore. In the very eventual, it will turn into a dead donkey, but even it, 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 sooner or later, it's going to turn to an elderly donkey that's not so useful. Um. So that's why it's 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 unique in that unlike unlike all the other things you donate, it can't become permanently useful, which is something that we are going to call that permanently belonging to the temple status. We're going to call that final consecration in a minute, but donkeys are not capable of that. They're not capable of being permanently uh, consecrated. Shetrilatahekdej, um, its beginning is as it's a consecrated property. It's it's it's. It starts out holy. It, it has become holy. Vikula lashamayim. It belongs right now completely to God. Umo alimba. And if you use it right now, you violate the prohibition on meila. Meila is the prohibition on using stuff that belongs to God. Um, it's sort of stealing from the temple, except you don't actually have to. Uh, you don't actually have to cost the temple money in order to have done it. You just have to have benefited. Um, so. We are now going to learn that just like this uh, behemat mea has those uh, features, af kol hekdesh, likewise anything which is primary sanctification, meaning you made you declared it holy, and it belongs entirely to God, um, it will also have meila. Now, an animal that you donate. As, as a, a kosher animal, you donate it as a sacrifice, does not belong entirely to God, right? Most animal sacrifices, either a kohen or the owner is going to eat some part of it, often many parts of it. And even an ola, which is entirely burned, the skin goes to the kohen. So it, those things are, the, the animal is not completely the property of God, Unlike this donkey, which completely right now belongs to God, and God actually has no use for him. Okay, so and the the claim here by this Tana teaching this Brita is that that is a category things that belong completely to God, that there is meila. Okay, so Amar le Rabbi Elazar the Tana. So Rabbi Elazar said to the Tana, Bishlam Akul Shemaim. He said, I understand this idea. That something that belongs completely to God is the thing that you violate me with. Lima'ute kachim kalim, because that excludes um kachim kalim, which I guess literally means light sanctification or something like that. But it means sacrifices that are eaten by, partly by the owner, right? A shlamim or a toda or a koran pesach. Those things are called kachim kalim. Those things, there's no meila in the sense that the owner, when they eat it as part of their sacrificial offering, they're not violating the Torah by eating it because that's what they're supposed to do. Okay, so th those things are what's being excluded when you say there's meila when it belongs completely to God. Kevan um, di'it lehu labalim begavai, who since the owners have rights, some rights in it, so we can't say that it really has a prohibition of me'ilah. But Rabbi Elazar goes on, he says, But when you said that the the um, the non-kosher animal is unique or is particular in that it is primary sanctification, what are you trying to exclude? Anything that I say, donate to the temple is primary sanctification. Trilat hektesh, who to eat by be meila, so hektesh late by meila. And furthermore, are you trying to tell me that when it first becomes holy, it has a prohibition of meila, but when it reaches a level of final sanctification, it doesn't have meila? So, right, those, if, if, if instead of selling your house, they had decided to dismantle your house and use those stones to make an addition onto the temple. So there would totally still be a prohibition of me'ila on those stones, even though they've now reached a level of final sanctification. So it doesn't make any sense to say that there's only me'ila on primary sanctification. That doesn't make any sense. So he says, maybe that's not what you meant. 
Dilma le'inyan chumesh ka'amarta v'chirabi Yoshua ben Levi. Maybe you were thinking about what Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said, and you didn't mean primary sanctification as opposed to final sanctification. Maybe you meant primary sanctification as opposed to the fifth that's paid in redeeming your primary sanctification. And you were thinking of what Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said when he said that there's no chomesh on the chomesh. Um, in fact, there's no chomesh on even the secondary sanctification. There's no chomesh on anything that's traded in for something else that's holy. He said, yeah, that's what I said. That's what I meant. Um, so Rav Ashi said to Ravina, so Rav Ashi says to Ravina, and again, I'm not, we seem to have switched scenes again, and I don't know exactly how Rav Ashi and Ravina and Rav Achami Difti, who we're going to meet in a second, how they relate either spatially or temporally to Rabbi Elazar and his Tana. Um, so Rav Ashi said to Ravina, There, the uh, non-kosher animal can be primary sanctification, but it can't be secondary sanctification. Uh, I guess that means you can't trade in a donkey to uh, redeem your dining room table. Because... Um, it's not capable of taking that that status. Um, to Amarle, and so Ravina said back to Rav Ashi, Lefisha Enabasofektish. He said, Well, it can't take the position of middle sanctification because it can't take the position of final sanctification. So because it can't go all the way to the end of the process of being final sanctification, it's not allowed to progress past the level of primary sanctification. Uh, so then Rav Acha Midifti sticks in. Amrli Rav Acha Midifti the Ravina. Be'emse hekdesh miha ita velo seif lechomesh. So Rav Acha Midifti says to Ravina, wait a minute. You're saying that it can't be emse hekdesh, it can't be middle hekdesh because it can't be final hekdesh. Do you mean that it actually can be middle hectish, but it's just going to act as if it's primary hectish? Primary sanctification, meaning there'll still be an extra fifth if you redeem it. So now it sounds like I can trade in a donkey for my dining room table, but the donkey is going to have the status of a an originally donated thing, and I'm going to have to pay extra to get it back. Um... Amarle, so Ravina said back to Rav Achami Difti, Harehu Kisof Hektesh. He said to him, No, actually, it can get to the level of middle, but it's going to be like final in the sense that Masof Hektesh Eno Mosif Chomesh, just that, like the final sanctification doesn't add a fifth to redeem it. Likewise, the middle sanctification isn't going to add a fifth. So now it sounds like there's no fifth for final sanctification. So maybe those rocks that we took from my house and used them to add an addition onto the temple, when now the temple has some further repairs and they decide to deacquisition some of those rocks, maybe now I don't have to pay extra to get them back. That's interesting. We didn't know that before. I'm not sure that this seems highly theoretical at this point, because what are the chances we're still going to know whose house the rocks came from at that point? But okay. Um, I'm really Rav Zutra Braid uh, Rav Mari Laravina. So now Rav, Z Rav Zutra Braid Rav Mari also asks Ravina a question. He says, "My chazi de midame le lesof hektesh. Why are you comparing it to final sanctification?" Need may let's feel affected. How about if we compare it instead to primary sanctification? Right? When you have something which is uh what we're calling middle sanctification or secondary sanctification, you traded in your donkey to in order to uh redeem the dining room table. 
why are you saying that it should be similar to the final? Let's instead say it's more similar to primary, which actually the truth is it seems more similar. He says, nope, it makes more sense to compare it to final hectage. Because that way it's sanctification, which came by being a uh by replacing something else that's holy. I'm learning about that from something else which got its sanctification by replacing something that's holy. Right. <clears throat> but then he says, Adaraba. No, so I think this is Rav Zutra talking back, right? Ravina said, no, it makes sense to me to compare it to the final. And um, Rav Zutra says, no, that does not make sense. Adaraba. <laughs> to the contrary, you should compare it to primary hektesh. Because we should compare things that still have other uh, layers possible in the future with the things that have other layers of holiness possible in the future. Right? The, the, it, mad, it doesn't matter so much where it came from. It matters where it's going to. And the donkey is more similar to the dining room table than he is to the rocks that were reused in the walls of the temple because the donkey and the dining room table both have a future of becoming a holy and becoming not holy, making other things holy, whereas the rocks have reached their final destination. They don't have a future. Okay. That seems to be the end of that scene, sort of, except now we're going to try to explain it a little. Kida Amar Rava, like Rava said, Haola Ola Rishona. So the Torah says that the um it says the Ola back in this is the Parsha two weeks ago. Um and Rava says when it says the Ola, that means the original animal that you originally sanctified. It doesn't matter so much in what context he said it. But we're going to make an analogy to that and say, likewise, in our verse at the end of Vayikra, when it was talking about donating non-kosher animals and then redeeming them again, it called that animal Hatimea, the non-kosher. So we're going to say that means, well, it has to be the first layer. And in fact, it can't be replaced and it can't replace something else. You can only have a Tmea as primary sanctification. In because that's what the the um that's what the the on the non-kosher animal was telling us is that it has to be this one. Um Tanya Kavate Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. We have a Brita now supporting Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is a an early Amora, but he's still an Amora, and we're now going to quote we're quoting a Brita that seems to support his position that there is only ever a chomesh on the original donation. Parat zu tachat parashel hektesh. So it, the bright has a case. Suppose I go to the temple treasurer who is auctioning off this cow that people donated. You have to imagine that it's a cow donated for um, temple upkeep, not a cow donated as a sacrifice. Uh, so maybe there's something wrong with her such that she's not qualified to be a sacrifice. Not clear. In any case, um, the the intended purchaser says, I will give you a different cow instead of that cow. Or talit zu tachat talit shel hektesh, or I would like to give you this talit instead of that sanctified talit that you're trying to auction off. Then what happens? Hektesho padui viyad hektesh al ha'elion. That works. The sanctified property successfully gets desacralized. But the temple treasurer has the upper hand. And what that means is that we're going to do an appraisal of both objects. And if the object you traded in wasn't worth enough, you're also going to have to cough up some money. Um, if it turns out the object you traded in was worth too much, too bad. Right? That, that's why we say he's the upper hand, is that they can make you pay more, but you can't get anything back. Um, uh if on the other hand you come to the uh temple treasurer and you say this cow 
<laughs> which is worth five selas. I'd like to you trade it in for that sanctified cow over there. Or talit zu bechamesh slaim tacha talit shel akdesh. Or this talit, which is worth five selas. I'd like to trade it in for that sanctified talit. In that case, hektesho padui that works. You've successfully desacralized it. Um, and al hektesh rishon mosif chomesh al hektesh sheni ein mosif chomesh. And the brighter just kind of tacks on at the end. By the way. The hektesh rishon, right? The the thing that you're trying to get back from the temple of treasure because it was donated. That if you're its original owner, you have to pay a chomesh. But hektesh sheni, but the the secondary uh, sanctification, so the the cow or the talit that you are treating in, that you're not going to have to pay a chomesh for, even if you, the owner, um, redeem it yourself. And that seems to support Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi's claim that it's only the original donation that get has an added payment of a fifth. The uh, the anything that's traded in for it does not end up paying a fifth, either the the pr the principal or the fifth that's traded in. Okay, that was hard and complicated. And are there questions? Yes, John. The passage which says that the cow, which is worth five cellars instead of that sanctified cow, suggests that when you're adding a fifth on, that it's a fifth of five, not a fifth of, a, a fifth of five before adding the piece on, as opposed to a fifth of a five you get after adding the piece on. I think the difference between the five cella cow and the cow that didn't have a price specified is according to the commentaries I looked at, I think that the difference is that um, in the cow that doesn't have a specified price, <clears throat> if the cow isn't worth 125% of the cow that you're trading it in for, then you have to pay the difference in money. Whereas the cow that's supposed to be worth five cellas even if it's worth plenty of money, suppose the cow that you're trying to trade it in for is only worth two cellars, right? So it's worth plenty of money to redeem that cow, even if it's not all the way up to the five cellars you specified. But because you promised five cellars, if the appraiser decides it's not worth that, you have to pay all the way up to the amount of money you said you were paying. Um, even, even if that's vastly more then you should have had to pay for the thing you're trading it in for. Otherwise, I don't think there's a difference between the case where you specified what the cow is worth and the one where you didn't. Um, and I, I don't think that's why it's best. I, I, I think the specified price is just to give you a different kind of case where the temple treasurer's hand is on top, where they can... Right, because if if it turns out the cow was only worth four cellas, they can make you pay another cella. If it turns out the cow was actually worth ten cellas, you're just out of luck. Because in any fight about who owes who money, the temple treasurer always wins. Does that make sense? All right. Any other questions? We've already gone over time, and I'd kind of like to make sure I get to my next class on time. Um, I think we will have class next Monday, but it depends a little on how my Pesach kashering goes. The following two Mondays are Yom Tov, and we definitely, or yeah, the following two Mondays are Yom Tov, and we definitely don't have class. Um, I think I'm gonna have I'm gonna teach next Monday night, but I'll let you know. Because if the koshering doesn't go so well, then maybe not. It's okay. We are all in the same boat. <laughs> yes, I, I I know. And I wouldn't, if it weren't for the fact that it's a really long chapter, I wouldn't even think of doing it. But I'm getting worried we're not going to finish it before the end of the semester. But I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll let you know. Anyway, thank you very much. And I will see you later. Good night. Thank you. Odesh Tov. Odesh Tov.